Okay, so I, I, I guess everyone is here um, for this portion of tonight's presentation, which is actually, uh, Jonathan and I were just <laughs> joking, it should be a, a, um, a, a Jim roast, but, but Jim's not here to be roasted, so we, we can't do that. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but he would appreciate it, yes? He, he, he would appreciate that. But it's, see, he even had the title for it. Uh, Theosophical Rose, too? Okay, we'll, we'll have a lot of those. <laughs> um, but uh, on the serious side, this was just something that we thought would be uh, heartfelt um, for an individual who gave so much to the idea of ITC. And so my role here is just to you know, say a few words in terms of opening it up. And really, this is about each one of you who feel as though you'd like to remember something about Jim and, and share that with us, uh, to come up here and, and, and actually do that. And so uh, just to break the ice, um, even though I didn't know Jim as long as I've been alive, I've known him since more intimately 2006, and I think that was the time, um, and, and Garrett, you are probably the best historian on this because you know, you've been around for a while. You know. uh, uh, Julian occurred in, uh, the Julian conference with Jim and Sal occurred in 2006, correct? And, and then Willie Dade passed in 2000 and 2000. Okay, so there was a period wherein I guess I had met Jim roughly about the latter part of the, the 90s. Um, and part of that had been through some of the conferences that were ongoing with Willie Dade, who was a star in and of herself, just in terms of being a magnet uh, that drew people from different traditions to come up um, during uh, one time a year and have a gathering. Um, and during that time, things happened in a sense spontaneously. People would share, people would listen, people would eat, and it didn't matter at that time what group, affiliation, label, title, organization you belonged to. If you were there, you were just an individual who shared with the others. And so even though Willie Dade didn't have it in her mind to establish anything, again, as far as I know, uh, when she passed, it was almost as though there were kind of a void. And I remember Jim and Sally talking, uh, and Jim was always thinking. He was always trying to push the envelope. And uh, I would oftentimes think, I tried to make people feel uncomfortable, but Jim could do that better. And and. And, and Sally, I realized, and perhaps you can tell me better, Jonathan, but Sally would provoke Jim. And so deep down there, I mean, I really knew, as usual, who the boss was. Um, but, but, but Jim was, was quite, quite the character. And so he and, and Sally again, and I, I don't know how the original idea had come up, but they started talking about the gatherings, and um, at least with some of those talks I had with Jim, it was really about this desire that he had to overcome the apparent differences, to overcome the boundaries, um, to get the kids back together despite the fact, as the analogy was used the other day, that the parents got divorced. And so even though the parents don't like each other, we can still play and we can still talk and we can still share. And so he began, I guess, with um, Sal, and I don't know how much, again, Jonathan, Sally, and he were of equal mind about this or she really kind of pushed his engines to make him open his mouth more about this, but, you know. Yeah, I was gonna share more of that when I Okay, all righty, so. Yeah, and that's that, and and I and I love that dynamic, and I saw it in action sometimes when they were by themselves, and I just happened to be passing by. <laughs> um, but again, I mean, I, I with Jim and myself, I mean, we would spend sometimes a lot of time on the phone, and and he would actually tell me is is typical. He says, you know, I gotta go. He says, uh, there's only so much of you I can take, and yet it was <laughs> interesting. Oh, well, I. I that's, that's what he would say, um, because 
he was a psychologist and I'm a shrink. And we would have these conversations and a lot of the conversations would be, be about the psychological aspect of the theosophical teachings. And then the other part that he loved were the elementals. And so we would have talks about these elementals and then he would talk about synesthesia, which was the uh, equivalent in the 1800s of the individuals that had psychic powers and could see things and feels and energies and all of that. And we would just go on and on for sometimes two hours. And I would sometimes hear the silence on the other end of the line. And I would say, Jim, and then, no, no, he wasn't asleep, but he, he would just be, yeah, I think I gotta go, <laughs> I think I gotta go. But I mean, I, I appreciate those talks with him because they were enlightening, they were about sharing, and always mixed in that was his questioning about how to do this. Um, and it wasn't so much a questioning to me about how to do this, but just him questioning, and perhaps maybe that was some of the dialogue coming back from Sally in terms of the conversations they were had, because he would always say this is bigger than any particular theosophical organization. And he would talk a lot about trying to link up with the libraries here to have access equally to all of the information that the information that was available at Point Loma, the information that was available at uh, the TS, um, to he was talking about, in, and this is in the early 2000s, about digitalizing all of the information so that it could easily be sent out. And I'm just saying, Jim, I want to talk about theosophy, and, and he's talking about the way of using theosophy in the world and sharing it amongst each other. And that's what I guess he and Sal then did because they put a lot of effort and a lot of time into this. How many years was Sally president? Uh oh. <laughs> um, about five, and then you, Garrett, how many? Yeah, so again, there was that nine, uh, eight to nine year sprint in which these conversations and side dialogues were going on. And uh, in the midst of it, you know, sometimes we would have really, really honest talks about what the real problems were. Why, why was it that people felt the way they did about their teaching? Why did ULT perhaps feel that they were more elite than the others? Why were we bought up being told that they didn't have the real truth. And at the end of the day, there were no real meaningful answers to that. And so as people in the field of psychology, we just had to call prejudice, prejudice, and bias, bias, and look at what could be done in a general way just to, again, bring folks together and to have folks conversate. And, and this is what now, uh, we became official, you said the other day, Herman, in uh, 2008 as ITC. We had had several years before that just in terms of almost freestyling it. Um, we had had some nice conversations, uh, conversations, the uh, conferences in New York that were different and unique and multifaceted. We had the ones in uh, twice in Julian, I think, uh, before we had become official. And uh, it was always a good thing to be at. And I, I thanked Jim for that. I thanked Sally for that. And I, I also thank them for their friendship because they were special folks. And when I think of Jim and I think of Sal, um, I had written it down months ago, the passage in The Voice that talks about the stones and the guardian wall. And I say to myself that although their bodies have gone back to the elements, I know that those life forces have simply been withdrawn and they're part of that stone wall. And you know they'll be cycling back like we recycle all of the other stuff uh, very shortly. And um, I wonder what he's gonna think when he comes back and this is where we're at. <laughs> but again, um, I just would like to open up the mic um, for whoever would like to share some fond memories, some roasting jokes or some 
things that uh, may not have been so nice that Jim said, <laughs> or Sally for that matter, um, in terms of the specialty. Come on, or, or, oh, was there a lady first? No, no, okay. <laughs> oh no, you're pointing at him. Okay, thank you. Well, let me talk about uh, how I learned uh, Sally and Jim. We were invited uh, to attend a conference uh, in Petaluma, north of San Francisco, in the middle of nowhere. We, uh, Johanna and I, had really the idea that we were going on a uh, desert expedition. But okay, filters uh, all around you over there. So that was not a very stable one. And um, Jim and Sally were there. And we followed the uh, conferences. And then he, on the end, he asked, from, um, are there some people who likes to support us with the uh, idea of these conferences? Nobody was reacting, so I was reacting, so I'd like to do that. Later on, I learned in a report that he was writing down, yeah, he was disappointed because it was not coming support at the United States, and there was a strange guy with a strange <laughs> accident, uh, accent, and uh, yeah, what should we do with him, yeah? <laughs> So, being in the neighborhood again in the beginning of 2008, we ring them and say, okay, we are in, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, Julian, uh, are we welcome? Yeah, 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 okay, come along. <laughs> so we were coming there and then it was typical Jim and I expressed it on the Memorial Day already and he say, I say in that time, Jim, the animal Jim love most is the elephant in the room. Because, because sitting there, he starts immediately with uh, firing torpedoes on me in the style of, oh yes, um, uh, you are from the uh, Point Loma Club, yes? Yes, yes, yes. You are a leader, eh? Yeah, I'm the leader. Is that something like Hitler? <laughs> so no, Jim, it's not something like Hitler. <laughs> so... <laughs> And the, art, and the art was really to stay by yourself. And later on, I learned that shrinks like to do this, yeah? <laughs> they have something, you shake on a person, and then you see what is the amount of time he needs to be stable again, yeah? <laughs> and he is exactly doing the same. And that is, I think that is all their study, but okay. So we had a uh, great conversation, and uh, after an... Ah, well, I think almost an hour. Jim was more or less satisfied and said, okay, um, do you want to go with me the uh, paramita pot? Paramita pot? <laughs> What do you mean, in daily life? No, no. And then it works out in his garden. There was a road upstairs, and then he was having, how do you call it, a small house over there? A yeah, meditation house, you called it. And that was the proof that we were accepted. <laughs> and uh, there we were sitting, and there we were really speaking about theosophy. So that was the way we learned to cope with, uh, with Jim and Sally. But I, my personal impression was, and I think Johanna support me in that, is that the real spiritual force was quite often Sally. And if you want to be speaking about ITC or that type of activity on a serious level, the best thing that you can do is, in lunchtime, help Sally in the kitchen. Because by, by cutting uh, all different types of stuff, you can have a nice conversation, and later on you are able to work it out with Jim. <laughs> so that is the experience we had. And we did him once an absolute and very big favor. In that time, we were trying to do the Point Loma Coviviums in uh, San Diego. And in one of them, we invite him. He was doing the course with me, Think Differently, together with uh, Sally by Skype. And uh, we were giving the uh, Point Loma Convivium, and he likes to do something as well. And then he was coming up with a lecture, and that was absolute marvelous lecture. That was uh, Wilson. The title was Wilson. Maybe you have ever seen that film, that movie from, uh, what is his game? Uh, Castaway. Cast Away. And that is that guy uh, living on that island, Tom Hanks. He was uh, a pilot, pilot for HDL, and he, uh, he has a problem over there. So he comes on that island alone. And, um, well, 
he feels very on himself and he tried to solve that. And there was a ball, a big ball, and he starts to draw a face on it and, uh, and so on and put it on a stand and called it Wilson. So he had his daily conversations with Wilson, asked Wilson what he should do here and should do there and so on and so on. But the clue of the presentation was, and I think it was really the best of the MI know, is that he said everybody has his Wilsons. And the main question is, is that wrong or not? And he said, no, it is not a problem, as long as you are willing to change one Wilson for the other. If you have one Wilson and you stick your whole life on that, that is a problem. But it should be dynamic. And we all have our Wilsons. That means we have our ideas and way of living, what gives us stability. But we are dynamic, so we grow and we get other view on lives. Then you should also be willing to change your Wilson. And that was a very good lecture. I tell him we have him still online, but um, maybe we should put him more forward and make a connection with the ITC side. So, and that, I must say, an, a very impressive couple, what I serious uh, look forward to see in the next incarnation, <laughs> special if we go for the idea that we both learn from this incarnation, and maybe he becomes a little bit more friendlier. But in, in itself, in itself, in itself, it was no problem at all. If you know who he was, then you had no problem with it. And the only thing what you have to do, stay by yourself and go for the things you like to go. So I must say that um, being part of ITC since uh, 2007, because 2007 was the first time, uh, since then, I have uh, attended all the ITC conferences with Johanna together. 2008, we be becoming uh, official. Co-founder uh, Garrett uh, was inventing a very nice, uh, I don't want to say trick, but approach. So everybody who was on the conference was by definition a member. Yeah? yeah? And that works very well, I must say. Because we had members, we can vote, and from then on we start the development of uh, ITC. So we worked together uh, in Julian again uh, for the second time. I think that was nine, 2009, if I remember very well. And he had organized a lot of things. And the only problem was that he has to spread it around on the city hall, on, an, uh, on a school, on some other places. And yeah, there was a small problem. We have to clean it. Yeah. So the Point Loma people were taking the uh, city hall uh, room and we were cleaning, cleaning, and cleaning. And then a uh, guy was passing by and he said, hmm, it's very nice, the toilet's over here. So, yeah, well, we have to clean it to use the room. Yeah, but that are the public toilets. <laughs> so we were cleaning the toilets for, uh, for Julian on that moment, yeah? <laughs> but okay, no problem at all. We have learned a lot. We have really learned a lot. And I must say, the atmosphere between the different uh, theosophical organizations since then has grown in a positive sense very, very much. And now we are happy to see each other. In that time, it was a little bit, oh, where are you coming from? Oh, yeah, the Point Loma guy. Yeah, our leader. We don't like leaders. We don't like leaders. Yeah. <laughs> so they have no idea what a leader was in our tradition. But I think um, if you set your target and uh, that was cooperation and spreading theosophy into the world, it works marvelous. So I think, uh, speaking for Johanna as well, I think we are, we are very great that we were able to learn from this couple because it was a very good example and a leaking, I'm looking forward for uh, continuation. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Jonathan a little more of the family side. I mean, I knew Jim so well, but it was almost always in the context of ITC and accomplishing things, and I kind of regret that I, I wasn't really a good enough friend for him. I really missed out on some of the sharing of, you know, obviously we did a lot of that, but he was such a beautiful man that we always think about what we missed. Anyway. Uh, I will tell you a little of the history there. We did start out with Willie Dade for about five years on the border of Oregon and Washington, and it was mostly ULT people, 
a few TS maybe uh, every couple of years and a few people from Europe, England and uh, Belgium. And then, and, and Willie was this wonderful person who traveled the world and been to so many lodges and created many lodges herself. And so she had all these connections, especially throughout California. And so when she opened her home and her lodge to us for a long weekend, uh, many people came and it was, it was the first time most of us had ever had contact with another ULT lodge, uh, aside from maybe the Los Angeles lodge, which attracts a lot of people. So this was, for me, an incredible experience. Um, <clears throat> gave me a lot of hope because our lodges were, in ULT especially, were dying out in those days. Uh, <clears throat> and when Willie passed away rather suddenly, um, we knew we wouldn't even have her home and we didn't know how well her lodge would do without her. And it didn't look like there were gonna be any more of those wonderful meetings. And a number of the people that were there, especially from Southern California said, gee, we could do that. We could put it on down here in a, a little coastal town near San Luis Obispo. I forget the name of it, Camarillo or something. Cambria, Cambria thank you. <laughs> and uh, so that was a uh, typical ULT. There were no officers, no organization. It was just people calling each other and saying, we'll rent out a house and can you get the uh, local high school auditorium? We'll have some lectures and we'll have a few you know, informal gatherings at the house. And even that was a wonderful event as well. And then each time we somehow had a cadre of three to five or six or sometimes 10 people that sort of co coordinated and had these miraculous, wonderful conferences come on each year. And I wasn't doing much because I was up in Oakland concerned about other things. And uh, I was sort of, I guess I was in the background as a speaker every year, but Jim got in around 2004, I think. He heard about it somewhere, came. <clears throat> and I think either his first year or his second year, the woman who was really running the show, I think it was from his lodge, Phyllis, got sick or had some difficulty and Jim stepped up and he and Sally sort of coordinating everything. I think that was the downtown or Mission Valley part of San Diego where they had the convention conference. And then the next year, Jim and Sally kept on being leaders. And another year, <clears throat> and then Jim called me up and he said, Garrett, I know you're a lawyer. Shouldn't we uh, maybe incorporate? And I said, yeah, very good idea because by the way, <clears throat> As organizers, we're all responsible if something goes wrong, personally. So it took us about eight months to actually figure out what our charter would say, our articles of incorporation. And then we brought those and proposed bylaws to the Philadelphia meeting that uh, we've mentioned. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and that was really incidental. Already, I think, uh, Herman and the the Point Loma people had come in, and we'd even had an event in Southern California uh, visiting Point Loma, if I remember right, and involving other theosophical organizations. So <clears throat> we put together this very loose organization, being sort of allergic to all organization because we were from ULT, and, and we were the ones in charge of it, but <clears throat> it was awkward. And so at the first meeting, we just said, okay, all you who came to this meeting, you're automatically members, and you get to vote on who's gonna be on the board. And by the way, we haven't had time to really think about this, so anybody who wants to be on the board can join. We got 24 people to join the board. And Jim said, that's wonderful, everybody should be on the board. I said, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> difficult then. <laughs> we had to do everything by email for that next year because there was 24 people and about 15 of the 24 never responded at all. <laughs> and it, it was kind of, so over the years we refined it. We got a, a smaller board, we got people who really committed and the Point Loma people really helped us to get focused and to think of what was really gonna work in the long term for continuous management. And Jim was the visionary. Jim was always thinking three steps ahead of most of us, certainly ahead of me. So Jim had ideas always. He said, we could leave California. So eventually we went to Philadelphia. Then I think we went back to Los Angeles. 
or somewhere in Southern California. And then Herman came in and offered to sponsor us to Europe. Wow, to The Hague. That was exciting. And I don't know if Jim coordinated with you or where the ideas came out, but you know, it came up at the LA meeting. We said, great, we'll give it a try. And um, <clears throat> about the same time, I think uh, shortly after perhaps, somehow Jim got in touch with Jan Kent from TSA. And Jan knows everybody in the Theosophical Society, Adyar. And he put out this wonderful, he still puts out this wonderful newsletter, connects everybody, tells us each other's biographies. Uh, it gave us a real global feeling. And so <clears throat> in following years, we went back to Narden and the, the uh, low countries. And of course, last year in Berlin. So we're feeling more and more international. And even back in 2012 was our previous time here. <clears throat> And I think that came out of Jan Kent and um, <clears throat> Jim strategizing and planning ahead. So they uh, invited the president-elect, almost as soon as he was president-elect, to come to our conference in Julian, as I recall. And the next year, with his coordination support, we were able to bring the actual ITC to this same hall. At that point, the TSA really became an active major component of ITC. So, <clears throat> so now we're looking at Brasilia, a new continent. Um, maybe I shouldn't be spilling the beans, but <laughs> I've, the word is out that we're doing something more adventurous. So every year or two, it seems like we take another big step in combining. And, and all of this kind of grew out of Jim's constant effort to help bring theosophists together. And for those who are young, you know, we had back in the 1950s a big movement called Theosophists Reunite. My parents were very involved with it. And we did have some big conferences, but it didn't really go anywhere. It was too new an idea. And uh, that percolated, though, in a lot of us. And Jim shared I don't know if this was ever public, but he certainly told me many times that he felt that the Masters of Wisdom were not going to come out publicly again or be actively supporting the movement if we couldn't get in harmony, if we couldn't reach out to each other's organizations. And I'm just so gratified that last 10 years we've really done that. And that's really the the great legacy of, of Jim Colbert and Sally. And I have to tell you, Jim has a theosophic idea, you know, and he knows how to stay in the background and work really hard and share the credit and put other people on limelight. And I, I, at first I questioned it. Jim thought, let's make Sally the president. I mean, Jim was doing all the planning as far as I could see, but he said, look, in later years, when I wondered about it. <laughs> he said, it's great to have a woman in charge. She gives a softer, kinder image. We guys are all about, you know, accomplishing things, but somebody has to be there to be the soft touch and, and, and to help connect us on that friendly level. Something that Helene is really fantastic at too, as I learned when we had our New York conference. And that was his wisdom, you know? Um, and he also foretold Jean becoming president, <laughs> very wise. I hardly knew Jean back then, except as a fantastic speaker. And so he's guided us very gently. You know, sometimes we had our differences, sometimes big differences. We all worked it out because we're all divide, devoted to that ideal that, you know, we really want to see theosophy become a power in the world again. And we want to see theosophists feel and know that they are truly sharing that brotherhood and sisterhood across all organizations and around the world. And, and for me, that's, that's my memories of Jim. So, I love you. I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I'm going to. 
I had the privilege of attending the memorial service in Julian for Jim, and I want to share what I observed. Um, first, I'd like to say that you know, if a tree is known by its fruits, um, Jim and Sally both gave fruit to such a diverse group of people, um, bettering them in all ways. And I would just like to especially tribute five very dear young people, the children of Jonathan um, and Dominique, um, who I love very dearly, and Sally particularly, and Jim, were so solid and there for them to help them blossom at a time when they really needed it. And it was very heartfelt at the tribute to Jim when um, the children were there, adult children. And it just, it was like life changing, life saving. You could see in their hearts what Sally and Jim gave to them with their utter, utter love and stability and wisdom. So I would, I'd just like to honor them as family members. They've given so much to their family and, and other family members that I don't even know. Um, I'm just sharing the little I do know. Um, I also want to share what one man said, and I'm going to mess it up because I only heard it once and I don't even know the man's name. Um, but he, he's a very solid Christian man. He said, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. And I believe in, you know, I'm, I'm a devotee of Jesus. And he said, I came to Los Angeles and there, I, I was down in the dumps. I had nothing. I had no money. I had no family. I had no car. I had no job. And I prayed to Jesus and I said, Lord, I put you in my hands. Your will be done. I looked in the paper and I saw an ad for, I believe he said it was for helping homeless youths. And he thought, well, I'm kind of in that situation. Maybe I can do something. So he called the line and I believe he said it was a recording of, I think, Sally's voice record, uh, talking about how they could help and we'll call you back, leave your number. So he called and he left his number. and. Eventually, he got a call from Jim Colbert, and Jim said, and just started talking with him, uh, basically the conversation evolved, well, can you help us out? We have some homeless youths that we would like to help. See, Jim did an amazing thing in Los Angeles, or, or down in San Diego, see, I don't even know the specifics, but he helped so many young people who were in dire, dire straits get their lives back together by helping foster youths and link them up with good homes. So he spoke with this gentleman and kind of vetted him out and made sure that he was a good person. And, and then uh, eventually it ended up that, uh, yeah, can you, can you take a young person in who really needs you? And the man said, well, uh, yeah, I would. I would do that. I would be willing. And, and then uh, Jim said, oh, good. So you'd take one. Uh, how about two? <laughs> And then the man says, well, I, you know, I, I don't even, I need a place to put them. And, and he says, yeah, I'll, okay, we can get arranged that. We can get you a house. <laughs> and, uh, and the man says, well, I, I, don't, um, I don't have any way to transport them. And, and Jim says, well, you know, if, if you take two more, you know, we can get you a big <laughs> minivan <laughs> and a salary. And, and anyway, the man said eventually that he realized that he had gone from homelessness with no family, no job, no car, through the grace of Jesus and Jim and Sally Colbert, he now had a family and a home, a job and a car, and he carried through with that commitment all the way until the young people grew up, and it was just a beautiful thing. And this is the, you know, this is the work that Jim and Sally did that was I mean, how many of us knew about that? So it was really inspirational. And Jonathan, I'm sure you can fix the story to make it all the details accurate. But that's the essence of what I had heard. I 
I better get up and say something. Um, wow. Uh, so for me, um, when I got involved with uh, ITC, um, Jim and Sally were transitioning, and I volunteered New York. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping I didn't know them very well, but I'm saying, you know, when I, when I spoke to them, do you think I could do it? Yes, and uh, we'll help you. And then um, when I would call uh, Jim and, uh, you know, discussing the details, if he didn't know the answer, he would say, no, talk to Sally. <laughs> so I said, okay, I got Sally. Um, and then suddenly Sally passed away and it was February, and uh, not only uh, did we have a big conference to coordinate, uh, but I felt uh, we had a grieving process that the whole group had to go through. So that was pretty extraordinary, and um, you know, if I say I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. So I was, I was gonna go over the finish line with this conference. I didn't know what it was gonna look like, but when you think of the energy and, um, what we were up against with uh, all the different groups, you know, and then the groups uh, w within, you know, towards each other, and um, and then uh, we had uh, uh, proposals for talks, and I said, Jim, you know, we've got like forty-eight proposals. What are we going to do? And he says, just accept all of them. <laughs> Because he was inclusive, and I said, "Wow, uh, okay, maybe maybe just one or two. We could just like, you know, um, and uh, and it was uh, it was like that. And then um, we uh, communicated, you know, about the conference, and um, uh, we started uh, meditating, you know, on Wednesdays, and then talking afterwards to see what ideas we had for the conference." Um, and started working together, actually, with clients and with kids. Um, so uh, I, f I flew out there, I remember, you know, and uh, and I cooked, uh, you know, for uh, Jim and VJ, who had um, bologna and American cheese in the refrigerator. Uh, so we made a nice soup. And um, I know from the New York uh, conferences that we had with Joe Pope, uh, chopping vegetables is definitely where it's at. You know, that's what I did, right? Uh, you remember when we had uh, 100 or so people together for the summer conference and the teachers would come to exchange ideas? So, um, and I would be hiding chopping vegetables. Uh, and that's all we did, really. Uh, we got together, there was no structure. We wish we had a structure. You know, there was a coming together, a feeling of coming together, and Willie was doing the same thing and more, you know, on the West Coast, but it was also happening and starting to happen in the East Coast. So uh, eventually, um, uh, you know, you got the feeling you wanted to do more. But, but when you have people come together, they have to eat, you know? So, so we got the vegetables down anyway on, on the East Coast. And then, um, then we had the conference. Uh, and, uh, you know, we stayed uh, in touch um, and uh, got to know each other better and better. And, you know, we're working, you know, towards more conferences and having ideas. And um, I remember uh, one, once early on he said, um, you don't pity me, do you? And I said, no, you know. And you have to be careful when you work with people, you know, who have challenges, big challenges, because uh, they can't have that feeling. And I work with handicapped people all the time, you know, uh, with autistic children and or whatnot. But, you know, it really just doesn't occur to me, you know, on some level, maybe because of my background. And, um, and then, uh, you know, so we watched uh, ITC uh, uh, grow and shrink and develop. And um, he, I, I do remember him saying uh, always about the libraries, he said, you know, this is not the first time that um, people have come together with the idea of unity in theosophy. You know, there have been other movements, you know, so uh, he didn't want us to be terminally unique, you know, uh, or get big heads about it. You know, there are other people 
uh, who didn't. And, and there were obviously skeletons in the theosophical closet. And when you're a therapist, that's what you do. You know, we have this ancestral DNA uh, uh, as a family, a theosophical family. So, you know, we had analysis, we had exchange of ideas, uh, et cetera, and always trying to depersonalize it, I think, you know, for the group uh, uh, and, and the relationships uh, that were going on. Uh, it was tense, it was creative, it was dynamic, it was wonderful, even though at the time it didn't feel that way. <laughs> Sometimes it, you know, it was like growth, you know, uh, uh, growth. Uh, but we had uh, a great deal of uh, uh, fun and um, I miss him enormously. I was very happy to be at the memorial event and the stories that were told, you know, it was just an incredible, uh, peaceful uh, uh, feeling. And I, I really look forward. Yeah, I have a feeling in his next incarnation, he will recognize him because he's probably going to be an Olympic athlete, right? You know, he's going to be running. He's going to be in some shape. Uh, and, uh, but I know that they'll be back soon. And they're with us even now. And they're going to come back uh, the way that we do if we keep this going, you know. And, and we set up uh, a, po a possibility, you know, for all this work. Of course, it will continue. Theosophy will continue. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we, we have a chance to come back and uh, with better bodies and, um, uh, you know, he was a character already, so I can't imagine how much more character uh, they both will have. But uh, I miss them deeply, you know, I really miss them. And thank you for the opportunity of um, uh, letting me get close to your family. You know, I mean, that, that, they're a really special group, and uh, we're lucky to have you all still. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be very brief. <laughs> um, you know, the way I came to know Jim and Sally um, was when we had the ITC meeting at, in, uh, at Julian. And, and when we were there, they took, invited us to go and have dinner in their place. And, um, and then after that, they showed us the path. And I like to remember him. I told you know Jonathan, when you mentioned uh, 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 both, I think the, the way I remember them is the part, or parameter part, which I think Elton Hall beautifully, you know, uh, explained and exemplified. And I like to think of him. He was on the path, showing us the path, and. What has already been said, which I don't want to forget. I will also remember two things on the path, and also remember him, his legacy, as already mentioned. The legacy of Jonathan. <laughs> the Theosophy. He, so he made sure that there was someone who would follow the path. <laughs> and then his children. So I like to be grateful for those. The, I mean, there are small other things, but I don't know the details, but. Those are the things that stand, the path and the legacy. I also just want to add some words, not very much. I am very grateful that I was able to uh, get into contact with Jim and with ITC because uh, this, what we are doing now, was always my deepest wish. In history, as Helena also said, and we have heard it from others, there were made so many attempts to make, uh, to bring uh, theosophists together, to really demonstrate uh, to the public that we can be one unity and one core to spread the theosophy. 
And for this opportunity, which he gave us all, and nowadays I think we are ready to do this and to go on with this, I am very grateful. So thank you. So I'm by no means the last person. If somebody wants to come up after me, that's great. Um, so um, I'll just say a couple things about Sally and a couple things about my father and about ITC and so forth. Um, Sally, my father got married three times. He liked women. <laughs> Matter of fact, he was always talking about, I'm going to steal Yoka from, from Herma. <laughs> He used to think about ways to do that. There's got to be a way, you'd think. <laughs> his best wife, my mother's a great woman, she's awesome. But his best wife was Sally. She was just, um, it was just such a happy and joyous um, thing. And um, now, just something about Sally. Um, I used to love to have conversations about Sally because she was. She's a very deep student of theosophy, but she loved Buddhism. So she would do a, all these deep dives into, you know, Pima Chodron and, uh, you know, this Lama and this Rinpoche and all this stuff, you know. But she used to, what she used to say about theosophy, she says, but I like to come back to theosophy too, because I can find some kind of a, like a sentence or a phrase in theosophy where I can come back up for fresh air, because I do all these deep dives and I go into it, you know, you know, like, uh, Everything is embodied consciousness, she would say, or something like that, you know, just something that's just like really true or something, you know, and then she just, and that kind of get her back grounded. So, um, so we used to have these wonderful conversations, and, and she was just wonderful with, uh, with my kids, unbelievable. Um, she was just a magician with them. Like, I had one son, we're probably beaming this live, but anyway, I apologize. <laughs> he, I'll be careful, Kim. He got into a real tight spot with his life. And um, you know when you get into a really tight spot, you don't want any help because it's that bad. And so his, his mother brilliantly got him in the car and drug him down there. Here, we're going down to Grandpa's house. Got him down there, and he was like, Where's the door? We're out of here. This isn't going to happen. I just I don't want help right now. And so there's like a silent spot. Hopelessness. This is going to crash. And it was life and death, really. But Sally noticed a tear, one teardrop coming down his face. She saved his life. She hugged him, and he broke down, and the whole thing, and there was a healing thing. Sorry about this. <laughs> you got to pull it together, but no, Sally. Um, another thing um, that they had together was um, kind of a demonstration about what a man and a woman can do together when they share a vision. Um, it seems that in theosophical history, there's been times when the, the most incredible, unbelievable magic can take place when a man and woman can work together. And it's, you could call it some kind of a yin and yang or some kind of a non-physical sexuality or just some kind of a dynamic that happens where just things happen that you would never think possible. And um, yet we've heard about how um, he, for him the idea of high beings and mahatmas, that was a very real thing for him. And, um, and for Sally too, for sure, for sure. And uh, so to have this bunch of divorced kids, as was brought up about 
going about talking about universal brotherhood and everybody in all the lodges throughout the world were on to universal brotherhood. But where's the lodge? How's that all work? Because everybody doesn't like the other ones. So we all have universal brotherhood except for those people. So we have universal brotherhood with 7.5 billion people except for, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How's that work? So it was just like, we've, we've got to do something about this, you know. And so, I mean, he would just say things like, you know, if a Mahat, I mean, how are the Mahatmas going to be able to do anything in the world when there's no field of unity to work through? And when we can't be some kind of a vehicle. And so uh, he deeply loved all you guys. Um, he deeply valued uh, his relationship with Helena. Deeply valued that. And he deeply valued his relationship with Herman. Um, the, jo the jo thing about the wife is, is, uh, is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, he just, he just, he deeply loved Herman. Uh, it, his, his devotion, his unconditionality, um, his brilliance, um, his ability to have these beautiful, group of people working, you know, together. And what an inspiration, you know. Um, and um, he's always trying to get me, he says, you got to get to know Gene Jennings. He's one of the most brilliant people on the planet. He's just, he's just a wonderful man. He's just, you got to do this, you know. And I'm like, well, I know, but he's kind of brilliant. I don't know how, I don't know how I can get to know this man, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, so he really tried to push me to get going on all this stuff, you know, and part of me was like, oh, I don't know about all this stuff, you know. Yeah, that's your deal, Dad, you know. But um, it's really been an inspiration. And just to see what uh, Sally and Jim did together, one of the things is like um, he was a star athlete when he was young. People, a lot of people don't know that, you know. Uh, he was, you know, cross country, good runner, thin and very lithe, and and you know, had it all going for him. Um, but he did get polio. He did get struck down with polio in 1962, and he's 28. And um, he was in an iron lung for six months. That's I think that's the story that I heard. And the guy on the left of him died in the act because there's a bunch of iron lungs in the same place. And the guy on the right of him died, and he's just waiting. Well, I guess I'm supposed to die, so here we go. And what happened, he told me this story. Uh, he said that a theosophist, so-called friend, came in and said, well, that's your karma. But I was talking to uh, Phyllis, and she said, you know, that's why he was so non-judgmental. And he took that, you know, and spun it in a different way, you know what I'm saying? Where you take energy and you do something different with it. And he decided that, I mean, he was just very non-judgmental in that way, even though he had torpedoes. Uh, <laughs> they're non-judgmental torpedoes, you gotta understand. <laughs> This is an impersonal torpedo. <laughs> uh, so um, I got a little poem that I wrote a long time ago. Well, actually, it was uh, the day after he passed away. So I'll read it. At the memorial, I had to have my son read it because I couldn't even go there. <laughs> he did a good job, didn't he? But I think I can handle myself here. Okay, so this, this poem's called I'll Do It. Uh, my father, James Noel Colbert, was made of some kind of adamantine substance like uh, steel, rock, pure will. Yet he was the essence of sensitiveness, of kindliness, of compassionate protection, of goodwill. Whenever he had an opportunity to help, even though he 
well, foresaw incredible hardships, he said, I'll do it. Whenever life's cruel fate told him that everything would be difficult, yes, everything, like moving his body around, like tossing and tugging a wheelchair in and out of cars, like driving with hand controls. Nevertheless, getting advanced degrees at UCLA, building and maintaining family, working for the government, building a robust private practice, building and maintaining group homes for foster children, that was mentioned, working tirelessly for theosophy. To all this, he avowed, yes, I'll do it. When revealed by karma that a soulmate is someone who, through your shared openness and intimacy, unlocks the secrets of your soul, whether you like it or not, he said three times, absolutely, I'll do it. <laughs> when invited by the gods to bring three souls into the dicey yet awesome arena of Theosophia, his response was, I'll do it. When realizing after many of life's setbacks that he could still have a meaningful relationship with his children, even though the road would be fraught with challenges, he promised, I'll do it. When given the privilege of raising four beautiful children into adulthood, helping them to become strong, bringing out their very best, he did not hesitate. Instead, he volunteered, I'll do it. When later asked to help three beautiful sisters to understand themselves, their lives, and what it means to go forth into this world, he replied, yes, I would be happy to, I'll do it. When he and his wife Sally saw that theosophists of different traditions needed a platform to come together to share what they all had in common, they both said, I'll do it. When his wife Sally passed away and he felt lost and wondered why he couldn't just join her on the other side, still he saw before him some yet unfinished business to attend to, some, some more articles to write, some more conferences to attend, some more protection to offer his family, saying of these last duties, I'll do it. When he saw the potential for the future in the eyes of the incredible new students coming into the San Diego Lodge, even though it was very difficult to go to those Gita classes, he said, I'll do it. When directed by his own conscience to truly exemplify theosophy as a living power in the world, even though only a few would really understand his sacrifice, he said, I'll do it. Even on his last day, when my father asked to be removed from artificial life supporting equipment, he gave assurances to the ICU doctors and nurses, to myself, Devin, Donna, Vijay, James, that he would be okay going forward He's like, don't worry about this, I got this. He said, don't worry, I'll be fine. I'm ready. I'm look he literally said this, I'm looking forward to this new adventure, okay? Give me a chance, I'll do it. Imagine the pre-birth panoramic vision of a soul like that. He must have thought before this life, and will no doubt Think to himself just prior to his next life, next time no wheelchair, no problem, I got this, I'll do it. So.
<laughs> He's not going to take you away, right? I'm <laughs> just checking. Just checking. <laughs> I want to share my impression of Jim and Sally. Uh, we met them very spontaneously because we went to the conferences and there was one thing. We immediately had the feeling we have met before. This is not the first time uh, with both of them. And when we sat in that famous uh, meditation uh, room of them, that building, then we talked for hours about uh, compassion, not about theosophy, but about compassion and about what we could mean and do uh, for compassion in the world. And that was the reason we were working so hard together to uh, try to make theosophy a good instrument in the heart of the masters. And that was always central for Jim and Sally, the masters. What can we do not to have their support? No, what can we give to them that theosophy is not only small pockets of studying people, but a real force in the world for understanding the wisdom religion we talked about this whole day. And they were adamant of that. And that was the integrity of both of them. They didn't want to be friends of us. No, they wanted to work together with us. And after that, many things happen. Many doors were open and we know from history, Janet, you are an archivist. We both know how many efforts uh, have been there to bring theosophists together. But it was always, we have to make a federation, or we have to be friends, all unimportant. It's the form, even friendship is a form. We have to be efficient, really useful workers of the masters. And Jim and Sally, uh, that was their main idea. And that is what we liked so much in them. And I think because of that idea, this initiative is still alive after so many years. Because we do not try to steal each other's members or to sit in your chair as a president or whatever. Yes, that is unimportant. And we did that together and I'm still proud of that. I have to add one thing. We went to California for, it, it is no use to come to America without being in California, <laughs> the, theosophy wise. Yes, you find there are so many different groups of theosophy, so we went to them all. And we studied with them and we listened to their lectures and so on, and we still love to do that because it opens doors. And then, we had to make a little uh, uh, interview with Joy Mills. You all know Joy Mills. And we had exactly that same experience with Joy Mills as we had with Jim and Sally. So it is not unique, United Lodge or whatever. You find it in any organization. And she, uh, now, let us say Herman's uh, reaction to Joy was the first minute they met each other, they looked at each other and Herman said to her, I wished I would have met you years earlier. And that makes us going in ITC to open doors, to let people find each other's hearts and not so much making photos, although we will do that tomorrow, <laughs> but it is a way of keeping theosophy a real instrument in the hands of the masters, like Jim and Sally wanted, and Joy Mills did exactly the same. Everything she did, what we could see in uh, the past, was to give that to the hearts of theosophists all over the world. And the fact that we have no 
source on our name tag. Yes, no Point Loma, no United Lodge, no TSA or whatever means that we have learned to find each other on that value of compassion. And I hope that will uh, go on forever. And I can tell you one footnote. Jim was controversial and he always tried to tackle you, but always your personality. Your ideals, he never tackled. He cherished them and he was your lifelong friend if you had uh, good ideals. And I don't say it uh, because of myself, or that is, would be a very personal thing, but he never was so nasty to me. Yes, and it is not for the reason uh, Jonathan just said. <laughs> yes? <laughs> When you were just impersonal and worked for the stuff, then he never did that. He tried to touch you in your weaknesses, and I really appreciated that, how he did that. So that is what I wanted to tell about George and Seth. Uh, Um, just he, he and I and he and other people would spend hours up in that meditation house, right? And um, one of the things that we kind of talked about was how the different organizations are like uh, concentric circles. They all have the same center, really. And, um, you know, like, well, which one's the middle circle and which one's this one and which one? It switches around. You know what I'm saying? It's like it depends on what the emphasis is and that that all of them uh, have, a, have a different genius that, that comes through. You know, not just something you tolerate, but something you admire, like genius, right? Like, like Mozart or something, you know? And the different organizations, they all have something that they do better than the other ones, and so we can all learn from each other. And so, um, while he was still alive, I wrote an article. Basically, he wrote the article, but I wrote, you know. So, and then I put it on, I put it on, uh, John Kind was kind enough to publish it, and he published it in lots of different languages and so forth, because um, he really liked it, and he had people really translate it carefully, you know. Um, so it's on Theosophy Forward, so if you just type in in Google, Theosophy Forward, uh, Forward Concentric Circles, it would probably come up like that. So it, it tells what, I think, what he thought. He, he, he liked it when it was done, so. I just would like on behalf of everybody here to thank everybody here for sharing with everybody here and for just helping us put things in a little bit of perspective because we're talking about the person, Jim and Sal, but the way that they've been presented, we're really talking about powers. And those are souls that have come for a purpose that you guys have recognized and that have almost embedded in their souls, I guess, the idea of something that needs to be done that they felt strong about and this is part of that result. So I'm just hoping that we can continue in this effort um, on behalf of Jim and Sal and all of the earlier attempts that were made because it's a simple thought that when HPB was here, there was no splits or divisions. And so if we're trying to get back there when you're talking about bringing those teachers back, we're just trying to get back to a position in which we have a focus for them, as Jim and Sal said, to do what they do. And so I just want to thank you all for sharing and uh, have a wonderful night and sweet dreams of Jim and Sal. <laughs>